This podcast is a quest for well-being, a quest for a meaningful life through the exploration of fundamental truths, enlightening ideas, insights on physical, mental, and spiritual health. The inspiration is love. The aspiration is to awaken new ways of thinking that can lead us to a new way of being. Being well. Welcome to Body, Mind, and Soul Healing Conversations. Many of us are challenged with chronic physical and mental illness because we have been unable to heal. We do not have to stay in that place, being stuck in our woundedness, because at our core we are spiritual beings with tremendous potential to heal. The gift of peace and thriving versus just surviving is actually attainable. There are many documented success stories of people just like you and Donna who have made that transformation. We have the same potential. Our darkest moments can be transformed into our strongest and most passionate parts. Valeria Telles interviews Donna Donahue, the author of Witness Awakening, Finding Peace and Healing in the Midst of Childhood Trauma. Donna Donahue, writing as Marie McCarthy, is a New Jersey-based psychotherapist. Growing up, she faced repeated sexual trauma that caused an insidious array of symptoms and struggles. She believed she would be a victim for a lifetime. But after 25 years of engaging in her own healing, studying trauma for over a decade, and practicing as a trauma psychotherapist, she is now thriving. In her book, she describes how she walked through pain into well-being, and how you too can release yourself from suffering and acquire the gift of peace. She hopes you'll join her and stand together as survivors. You can connect with Marie through her social media options listed below, where she offers a free toolbox of coping skills to acquire comfort, stability, and more, along with a calming guided meditation. Meet Donna at witnessawakening.com. Here is the interview with Donna Donahue. In your own words, who is Donna Donahue? The first thing that comes to mind is I'm a spiritual being having a physical experience. And in this physical experience, uh, many times a term has come to me called midwife of hope. And I, um, I work towards helping others hold hope uh, for their healing for their well-being when it's difficult for them to. And that can be from trauma or, you know, various other issues going on for them, for others. I think of myself as a wife and a mother, which I absolutely love those two roles, and a psychotherapist who specializes in trauma, an author, and absolutely a spiritual seeker. Thank you um, for being you again. I think I said off record. (laughs) And two questions um, that came to mind from um, the way you speak about yourself. So the first question is, when did you realize you were a spiritual being in a human body? And the second is, what are you seeking when it comes to being a spiritual seeker? My spirituality opened up mainly through my crisis phase of recovery, where I just cracked open and um, had a lot of uh, spiritual experiences and had been seeking to learn about spirituality in years prior, but never had actually experienced these unusual experiences that I I talk about in my book. And um, so I would say that would be in my early 40s is when it really took off for me as being a seeker. And what was the second part of the question? Oh, yeah. The first one was about discovering this reality or this truth that we are spirits in the human body. When did you realize that? I would say it was in that time that that I'm talking about where in my early 40s when I started remembering my traumas. 
And the goal or the, the, what I'm seeking towards is ascension. You know, it's the, the, the quickest way to yeah, yeah. <laughs> express it is to just keep working through my lo- various lives and my soul mm-hmm. evolving into a point where I can let go of the physical experience. Have we chosen to be here, Donna, and have the experiences, all the experiences we have had, or this is just a happening, life doing what it does? Well, in my belief system, I do believe that my soul on another level did choose a lot of or all of the events of my life, which can be difficult to take in when you think about trauma as a child. But I don't believe that the soul is looking at those experiences the same way I do in a physical body. That it's, it's a much uh, more expansive look at it as far as the soul learning lessons, evolving and growing through this vehicle of suffering. How would you describe what true healing is, Donna? True healing uh, is expansive, free, It's love. I believe that um, in love's presence, that energy has the ability to transmute victim trauma energy into thriver, you know, healing energy. I know that it's possible to happen because so many things that I would go through symptom wise earlier in my life after going through my crisis phase uh, of remembering and doing a lot of deep spiritual work, the symptoms literally disappeared, stopped. I haven't had a trauma nightmare in 15 years and they were nightly for a long time. When it comes to that love, true love or unconditional love, do you connect that with uh, inner peace? Would that be the same space? Yes, I, I think that we use a lot of words that yeah. describe love, yeah. like freedom, peace, contentment, expansiveness, openness, acceptance, forgiveness, right. are all aspects describing a loving energy that is all-encompassing, unconditional, and without exception. That has been, for some reason, has been one of my interests uh, recently, actually for a long time now, unconditional everything, unconditional wholeness, unconditional life, unconditional love, this being unconditional love. And from my perspective, I include everything. It very much feels like we are separated from wholeness, that we already, from that space, that we already healed, that there's nothing to be healed because we are whole. But at the same time, there's that feeling of you are separated. So it's that paradox. What an interesting dance. May I say something about that? Absolutely, yes. So many times when I'm asking, answering questions, I, I'm either answering it from a spiritual perspective or a physical experience. And, you know, in the physical experience, we are feeling like we're separate from our source, like we're separate from each other. But when when I look at it from a spiritual perspective of wholeness and oneness, then there is no separation. So Mm -hmm. it's almost like looking at it through two different frames. I wonder why so many of us don't have, I mean, we might, we don't use those lens, that frame of unconditional love, of wholeness. Do you also wonder why? Yes. Well, I believe it's the way our, we're brought up, you know, culturally, we, it, it just that language isn't, um, especially years ago, you wouldn't barely ever hear that. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, <laughs> and true. then once uh-huh. someone is exposed to it, then they're saying, okay, well, you're saying I'm part of uh, a oneness, that God is oneness, universal, um, what's the word I want to say, omnipresence. Yeah. But why do I feel like I'm at odds with a person in my life or separate from another being that's standing next to me. Right. And so it's confusing because the e- if you look at it through mm. the ego lens, which right. is the physical lens versus the, the spiritual lens. It, it is confusing, right? Because we cannot really understand intellectually that we are 
one, that we are whole, that everything's connected, there's no separation. We cannot actually understand that with the mind. Well, I mean, we cannot understand intellectually, rationally. It can only become a realization, right, Donna? Some sort of, uh, yeah, like a realization, maybe it's the word I can use. It's another word that I, a realization, not perception. I think perception, it, it is coming from the rational mind. Yeah. About but, experience. Experience. Yeah, that's another one that I have been actually talking to a lot of my guests about. Can we experience wholeness? It doesn't seem to be possible because in order to experience wholeness, then wholeness had to create the separation to experience itself. It's not possible to experience wholeness. It can only be realized. We have to be sensitive enough to go there. We cannot even see that because it cannot be experienced. I don't think it can be experienced, Donna. I don't think I have an experience of wholeness. I have, or whatever this is in this body, has, um, wow, no words. <laughs> I have, yeah, realization. Um, it's almost awakening from a dream. And Yes, that's it. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> yeah, something, the word that you use in your book, right, awakening. Yeah, that's why in spiritual teachings uh, that word is used a lot. So it's almost like awakening for the illusion of separation. It is the realization of that. It's not an understanding. It has nothing to do with knowledge because knowledge is the domain of separation. There's someone that wants to know something and that's an endless path. Do you want to make a comment about this? Or- uh, yes, please. Yeah, I believe that when any of us are working on our spiritual practice and we have an intention to move towards reconnecting or being aware once again of our oneness, that we have to deal with a lot of ego resistance. It's powerful. Um, I work with, I have a spiritual guru that I connect with regularly and um, I watch, I observe, I witness my ego resistance coming up over and over again. Oh, no, you're not going to do that again, are you? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Because it feels threatened, yeah. yes. um, the ego mind. <laughs> so it, it t- does take quite a bit of um, persistence and hanging in there and trying to trust that mm. that this really is our natural state, this oneness, and that right. we can allow ourselves to um, be aware of it once again. What do you love most about being in a human body? I love, I, I, the first thing that came to my mind is being able to connect with my dear ones in whatever way that is that, that, that you're capable of in a physical body and experiencing nature, uh, like the, that, yeah. that um, expansive, high vibrational, uplifting feeling yeah. of standing amongst natural beauty. So you wrote the book, Witness Awakening, Finding Peace and Healing in the Midst of Childhood Trauma. So written by you, Donna Donahue, but the name is different. You have used Marie McCarthy. So the listeners will know that. To find your book, they'll be under Marie McCarthy. Talk to me about the main inspiration and intention of writing your book, Donna. Okay. Um, I uh, was in this two-year crisis phase, and at that point I had about 15 years of journaling tucked away. Yeah. And one night, it was the middle of the night, it popped in my head, you're supposed to write your story to help another survivor. I noticed that I read a lot of survivor memoirs, and I wanted them to tell me more information. I wanted to know how did they get from point A to point B? How did they actually heal? What did they say? What did they do? And I also wanted to bring in the psychotherapist part of myself to help take care of them while they're reading my book. So I took um, about nine years going through all my journals and uh, you know, reworking the book over and over again, which was very challenging. I have uh, several uh, learning disabilities, and I just thought it was the craziest thing for me to write a book. Nice. So when it finally came to fruition, um, I was 
beyond Mm -hmm. ecstatic. And Mm -hmm. I wrote on the cover of the notebook that I I used to organize things, Mm -hmm. find a way, just keep going. Mm -hmm. So the the inspiration is that came to me, but the purpose of it was to reach out not only to other survivors, because I really want us to feel like we have a connection and that we're not alone and we're not insane. Right. We're, we're going through a wounding process of healing, mm. but also for people that live with survivors and people, uh, first responders and other therapists that work with survivors. I was hoping to give them some insight into the inner experience of the suffering that occurs when somebody goes through complex childhood trauma. In your book, in the very beginning, I believe you mentioned, yeah, before telling your story, you say, my purpose is to describe my journey of healing, not to trigger your own trauma. This is just the glimpse. And then um, I have, wow, I have lots of questions about that. Triggers, do they ever go away, Donna? Um, I don't know that they ever do completely go away. Yeah. I think that the response to them is what really changes the most. Mm. I've noticed that when I would get trauma uh, triggered years ago, I would have a very intense reaction you know, shaking and and all kinds of things going on. So these days, if I notice any kind of a triggering, it's much more manageable and mild than it had been, or it just doesn't happen at all. And part of that is that being conscious of and present in the moment, conscious of myself and knowing from all these past experiences that I don't have to lie down like a mat and fall to pieces, that I actually have the power within to rise up. And I like the word midwife, midwife myself through that moment, Mm. bringing in like my higher core self to help whatever part of me is being triggered. And you also talked about using interesting words, um, the terms shields up and deep breath. Mm -hmm. Uh, throughout. So you you kind of warning readers to look up for those terms within throughout the book. Why did you use those words specifically? Shields up and deep breath. And I love your um, empathy. That's thinking about the others. And I mean, in a very nurturing way. It's really beautiful. Thank you. I haven't seen that before. Um, (laughs) Shields up uh, part of my recovery work was that I learned that that I was very open and vulnerable so that when I needed to be mindful when I was going into situations to protect myself, that I could do that, that that's a possibility. And so I would imagine, you know, a golden bubble or I would be in a tank, you know, depending on how intense it was. It was some form of a shielding to, um, and I would see the other person's energy bouncing, like bouncing off of it and my shield and I wasn't absorbing it. And then it wasn't like a a traumatizing or upsetting thing for me. But shields up also, um, I used to love Star Trek. (laughs) Oh yeah, that's cute. Shields up. (laughs) And I just thought it was such a great um, way to just say, Hey, something's coming. Check in with yourself. If you're not feeling ready, you can step mm-hmm. away um, and just make a conscious choice if you want to go forward reading, reading. And the deep breath is just so important on so many levels yeah. for life in general uh, and, of course, with trauma because it activates the parasympathetic nervous system. When you take that deep breath you're telling, you're bringing the breath down into your abdomen. You're literally giving your brain a message that you don't need to be in fight or flight. If it's up high in your chest, then you're giving your brain the message, stay in fight or flight. And the longer the out breath, the better, because that's directly connected to the parasympathetic nervous system, which is the part of the nervous system that's the calming, everything's okay part. So what comes to me, I remember when I I saw that, reading that part in your book, it was boundaries. It has been a challenge for me for so many years to create those boundaries so I could protect myself. 
And to this day, it's a challenge, though. It's a challenging to say no to some people around my family, my husband. So what would you suggest, Donna, for those like myself who have a hard time creating? I understand them, but I still I have to work a lot more on that. Mm-hmm. And and I will be working on that the rest of my life. And it's a pro, it's a work in progress. But what some things that I have found that were very helpful was starting off in the process of therapy. I had to um, actually form a sense of self. I didn't really have one. I was borrowing others in like a codependent nature. And the codependent satisfies everybody else's needs and does the ultimate sacrifice of self. So I worked in the process of remembering to consider me, that I was in the room. And so when I was making a decision, I would ask myself, is this okay with you, Donna? You know, how does it feel if you say yes to that? Um, I told myself I was not allowed to let the word yes come out of my mouth until (laughs) it was either no or Uh I will think about it and I had to sleep on it Uh and then really let it sit with me and, you know, uh, digest it. Uh And then I would ask, is this for my highest good? Is this for me to do this? Because many times when we say no, if I said no in a certain circumstance, I was opening the door for someone else to say yes, who was supposed to say that yes and learn something from it. Right. My overdoing or overextending would block that person's experience. And if you tune into your body, Mm, which is, it tells us everything, literally we need to know. Um, That was a big part of my work was just connecting to my body. But if I take the time to tune into my body, I'll get like a strengthening, uplifting feeling if I'm supposed to say yes. And I'll get a heavy, uh, like a downward feeling or um, uncomfortable feeling in my gut. So it's about this relationship between you and you. Yeah. Where you consider yourself. And if it is for your highest good, it's most likely for theirs too, if it's a yes or a no. This is something interesting you said about, because we just talked earlier about wholeness and being one with everything that feels like incredible. But then there's the other side, which has is not connected to wholeness, but can also, like when you said that you have no sense of self, that sounds almost like a version of the wholeness that we talked about. Everything's connected and now you're just borrowing everything. You don't have to have a personality, fixed personality, solid anything. I'm just part of this reality and everything that's in it. But it feels very different, right? It's a tricky spot there because yeah. being um, selfless, sounds and is in certain circumstances part of being whole, being connected to the wholeness. When we are motivated to be selfless from our heart space, Mm. from a strengthening place, Mm, that's very different from being Mm. sacrificing yourself from woundedness, of, of not having a connection to yourself and learning that Mm. for some of us, complex trauma survivors, we learned that by satisfying everybody else's needs, it Mm. made us feel safer. Ah, So it's not coming (laughs) from the same place as that selfless, wholeness, strengthening spiritual energy. Yes. And and this was really interesting for me personally on the, the spirit for the spiritual piece was I realized that I had to first connect to myself as a separate body um, person before I could ever start letting it go spiritually in an ego sense. Ah, so is that dense, which this is. So the feeling of being separated that comes first, or maybe not, right, Donna? I remember when I was a child, not sure of the age, I felt really free. And wow, this is amazing. <laughs> like it was in, in this incredible dream and everything was incredible, beautiful. And, and then all of a sudden, I lost that. 
and then I was very judgmental and I was looking at my body, oh, I'm here, and then, then, and then everything changed. So it's interesting how we actually come into the world in this reality with this sense of expensive feeling and sense of being whole, and then we just kind of um, contract into this small, limited idea of the me, of the I. And then we experience a lot of traumas and a lot of challenges, and then we return to that. I mean, it, it doesn't seem to be possible to do that from the intellectual point of view. It's not a decision that we make. It cannot come from that place because there's no choice when it comes to wholeness. So whole, wholeness doesn't choose to go back to wholeness because it's already there. So who chooses? So is that the personality, the conditioned mind and body that's choosing to go back to to wholeness, not by choice, but by suffering? It seems like the suffering pushes us toward wholeness. I mean, it seems to me, doesn't it? Yeah. That, like you said, challenges will, can transform us. You phrase that differently. So something I have seen many times in my life, uh, talking to others and reading about other stories and in my own experience, is that through the, this intense period of crisis phase suffering that I went through, I, I kept drawing the same image series of images. It was um, a face. Then the next picture was the face with cracks. The next picture that was coming apart at the seams. The next picture, it was dis a disintegrated pile of ashes. And the last scene was this gold sprout rising up like a phoenix. So I had to, what I found is that when I disintegrated, some part of me died. It opened the door for me to say the suffering itself was so intense that at one point I yelled out to God, there's got to be something more. There's got to be something else that I don't know about. And I noticed around that time, a lot of things started shifting. Um, of course, in miracles came into my field of view. I've been a student of that for many years now. And I realized there is something else. And I had to allow this die off, this disintegration of parts of myself in order to start really allowing my true self to to grow and sprout and nurture that gold sprout. The inner work, the inner child work, talk to me about that and how does it play a role in finding peace? I never heard it that way. This term, CPTSD, uh, complex post-traumatic stress disorder. I have heard the PTSD, but not with the C before. Yes, the complex PTSD um, should have been in the DSM years ago, which is the Diagnostic Manual for Mental Health Professionals. Why it isn't now, I don't know, but most of us understand it that are practicing with trauma. And the complex piece is different because it's, it's repeated traumas throughout childhood. It's not a... Um, an assault at 25, which is hardly traumatic in itself, but it's this yeah. going on and on. And what happens is as the, this complex trauma is occurring for a child, it's changing the way their brain forms. You can actually see it right. on scans. And it, um, it tends to split off parts of the self into um, inner child parts. And if you're talking to uh, Richard Schwartz, who talk, who deals with inner internal family systems. He describes every human being with parts. Uh, yeah. So you all have multiplicity, but right, right. we just don't have multiple personality disorders. That's a different presentation. Right. So these different um, parts get developmentally arrested at the ages of when they're traumatized and when they started self-medicating, especially with substances mm, and things yeah, like that. Yeah. So the, the, the role that they play is that they're kind of stuck, this is what my experience was, in the past. And for example, um, I would have an experience in life and I would notice I was acting very young and... Um, out of control and just overreacting and couldn't figure out what it was. 
So one day when I was doing my work with myself, I was in therapy. It was during, a little before the crisis phase, I would go to meditate and I would see younger parts of myself and my mind interacting with me. Oh, wow. And I thought I was crazy. So I called my therapist and she said, no, Donna, <laughs> you're not crazy. You're doing inner child work. And yeah. I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> what I... These parts of myself that were young were um, would look dead like at times, um, yeah. devastated, raging mad, and naturally somehow was guided to bring my higher core self in to take care of them and actually reparent them. Mm -hmm. yeah. And in the sitting with them and witnessing their traumas, sitting by their side holding them, caring for them, showing up for them over and over and over again. Over time, these parts uh, healed and quieted down. I'm still aware of them from time to time, but they're very quiet at this point in my life, uh, thankfully, and because they feel safe. Is that how you work with your clients, Donna? Or do you use um, different techniques and methods? Well, I have... Um, quite an eclectic, massive toolbox yeah. at this yeah. point after 30 years. <laughs> oh, that's so for sure. I, use a, I ask to be guided um, before mm -hmm. I start a session yeah. and for the highest good of my client and I. And um, I usually fuse many techniques. It just kind of comes in and I start working. There may be a piece of inner child. There may be a mindfulness piece. There may be a somatic piece where we're working with sensations in their body that and the body will give us information when we connect. I bring their attention inward, guide them to the sensation. And we um, do this like, it's like a curious mind, yeah. uh, neutral witnessing yeah. of these different experiences. Do you also do hypnotherapy or have you experienced that? I went to a hypnotherapist, uh, um, which was... The vehicle that broke my initial block, it was the first time I had an actual visual memory, yeah. uh, flashback memory. And that kind of op that opened the door for me. And then I started having them on my own. So nice. it was very helpful in that way. Um, however, I got the whole experience at one time in the flashback, the visual, the physical, the emotional and it was devastating. I was really out of commission for several weeks. Nice. So I go with my clients, I try to go into their trauma with them sideways, very gently titrating into the trauma and then coming back out to a power memory and grounding them and then mm. stepping back in, not yeah. over uh, activating their trauma so that they're not re-traumatized. Mm, right. So it's gentle, the approach. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, I love that. Self-love, that has been a big one for me. How do you teach your clients to love themselves, to cultivate that? It's my favorite part of the work. <laughs> yeah. I, I, just, I believe that the relationship <laughs> between you and you, when it is loving, mirrors the relationship between your higher power in you. Um, and when that's in sync, you're really moving into a flow. But to begin the process, it's usually about um, teaching them how to be mindful of themselves, like learning about themselves. Yeah. Like, how do you feel in this situation? And, and how is that for you? And tuning in and asking themselves how they're doing. Um, another piece is really working with the um, inner critic. Yeah. Um, learning, you know, my inner critic used to be ruthless. Yeah. Um, I did a lot of, I'll guide my clients to do mirror work because it was so effective for me. You know, in the beginning, I hated it. Yeah. Um, I yeah. would say a nice thing, then an awful <laughs> thing, you know, and I tell my clients yeah. to just allow it. Yeah. it. It will shift, just keep going. And over time, they start learning how to say kind things to themselves when they make a mistake. Meeting themselves from a place of loving kindness rather than this more ruthless, hard place. And that builds trust and love between you and you. What was the most challenging aspect of your healing journey, Donna? 
The most challenging aspect was during the two-year crisis phase of remembering when I would hit points where I did not want to be alive, where I felt that I literally could not tolerate the degree of suffering that I was experiencing. It was mind-blowing. And I would, um, you know, some days sit like in a catatonic state with the phone in my lap ready to call 911 because I didn't know if I could trust myself. That was uh, extremely difficult. But I maybe even the hardest was the rage. The rage of um, that comes with complex trauma because the, the child's mind is egocentric. Yeah. So when bad things keep happening to them, it must be me. Yeah, um, I must be defective. That's the seed of shame. Mm-hmm. And in that shame is a self-hatred for this defectiveness. Mm. It started out being focused on my mother who did not deserve all that rage because I didn't remember my traumas yet. Um, Then it went towards towards society and my perpetrators. And the last frontier was when I faced my self-hatred. And that scared the hell out of me. That was very difficult to work with. I did realize though, over time of visiting this space, that it was my fear of it that was so terrifying. It wasn't the actual experience of releasing it, Mm. witnessing it. I would punch pillows. I would do whatever I needed to do to to empty the container, to like give it a context, a place to be. And I realized that the rage wasn't something to be terrified of, that it was actually a release and part of the healing. Mm. Oh, wow. What an important message. Not being afraid to feel, yeah, not being afraid of fear, which is interesting. It's a lot more powerful. Yeah, I have experienced that too, which is basically being open to experience feelings, uh, let them flow and watch them. That's a challenging one for most of us who have not done the work. Thank you so much, Donna, for being an inspiration to us all. Oh, and thank you, Valeria. And I do have another question. Yeah, I wanted to ask you this question. What is your message or vision uh, for ending childhood sexual trauma in our society? What first popped in my mind is working with children um, at a young age, you know, writing books that are age appropriate about self-empowerment, about the ability to say no. Um, teaching them things that grooming people that groom perpetrators, pedophiles, uh, abusers, the types of behaviors that they do, like yeah. gaslighting, where they yeah. make them feel like they're insane. Yeah. If children had some awareness of these type of things, they would these behaviors. They would know, oh, that's something I learned about, and I can. It really is okay. I can talk to somebody about it. And then, of course, working with our system of how we help children once they tell yeah. to keep them safe. So helping them to recognize yeah, behaviors in, in anyone, which will start with themselves, right, Donna? Recognizing their own, learning more about themselves. That's a beautiful idea. So I love the, uh, the meditation you have. This, uh, you offer in your book a free guided meditation for relaxation. There's a link there. So I'll have that on your podcast profile too. Would you like to make a comment about meditation and how helpful it is? Oh, yes, I would love to. Um, meditation was, is a part of my life now. It was a big help in the rough parts of my healing. Even if I couldn't really settle in, it still was a reminder that I could um, bring myself down several notches through yeah. breathing yeah. and just being open, uh, finding a safe space to open up. And many times I would have uh, healing visions would come to me mm. while I was in that state. And I just highly recommend it. Journaling, yeah. yoga, meditation, uh, tai chi, mm. kickboxing, things that... Um, the Tai Chi and the yoga more so for the calming the body and releasing trapped energy and the things like kickboxing for self-empowerment and releasing rage. 
and then the meditation piece for that calming and connecting spiritually. Yeah, that sounds really like a great recipe, working the mind and the body. Yeah, yoga does that, but not the kickboxing. Yeah, not the releasing rage. That part is not there. I don't think so, right, Donna? Yoga, they don't offer that. Not not in my experience with it, but in, yeah. and just in addition to the, um, the guided meditation on my website, there is a page of a toolbox where there's a lot of tools to help with anxiety, depression, trauma. So. Wonderful. I'll have the link on your podcast profile. Before I have these ending questions for you, but before I ask them, would you like to add anything or read a passage in your book? Yes. I picked out a, um, a vision that I had that was a powerful um, indicator of the point where I started transitioning from feeling very small and vulnerable as a victim into a thriver warrior. Mm, And uh, so this is the vision. Yes. Um, It's called I, the warrior. I am on a beach and a muscular, dark skinned man approaches. I look into his eyes only to see evil intent. He picks me up and carries me across the rugged terrain. When I reach out to touch him, his face turns into a dragon head with a huge mouth and teeth. He swiftly takes a bite out of my upper abdominal area and leaves a gaping hole. I don't even flinch. I will not be a victim this time. I jump down out of his arms and hit his breathing acupuncture point with a dragon fist. The position of my impact takes his breath away. With great speed, I move my right hand down to his left hand and forcibly back up karate chopping the left side of his neck and then striking his neck with the right elbow. Then I karate chop the right side of his neck. The dragon man doesn't know what hit him. He's completely caught off guard by my courage and ability to protect myself. I twist his head, it's a little violent, and break (laughs) his neck. As he falls, I knee him in the groin. Next, I go behind him and reach around to gouge his eyes out. This prick won't be able to see or rape another ever again. Mm. This time, I am the trickster, the surprise attacker. And Mm. this time, I will be able to protect myself Mm. from the scariest of creatures. Mm. We are at the edge of the cliff now, and I kick the man off into the ocean. He has the head and tail of a dragon and the body of a man. I climb down the cliff and slowly drag his limp body up the entire rock face to the highest point with incredible strength. This is when I put my right foot on him, raising my right arm up to the heavens with a sword outstretched. I yell out powerfully with guttural sounds of victory. No longer am I a victim. I feel courageous. I feel like Kali with no fear of any kind, just total confidence and power. I watch as days pass and the vultures devour his carcass, just as I have devoured his life. I wear his bones as a necklace and as a symbol of the warrior I've become. Wow, very that intense, was a I know. very intense story. I mean, um, metaphor for inner strength, right? Um, empowerment. Wow, that's amazing. I didn't read that in the book, so it took my, my surprise too. Yeah. So <laughs> let me, let me well, just... My, my child self <laughs> needed to have um, justice on more of a concrete level. So different visions like that that would come up, uh, my adult self my and my higher self knew that's what was happening, um, that it was about, it was all symbolic, you know, nothing that I would ever actually do to someone. <laughs> of course. And the fact that Kali came, was represented at the end, the goddess of life and death, uh, Hindu goddess, is somebody who came up in many visions she guarded a cave where I would see my baby self in. And that's what she would do when she would over- overcome evil. She would put her right foot on their body and she'd have a sword up stre- outstretched with bones around the neck. And I didn't know that 
those details until after I had that vision, I started researching her. And I saw those images and I was like, wow, that's really interesting. What comes to me by listening to you is having the power within enough to say no when we really mean no. It, that has to do with boundaries, with that. Uh, yeah, the strength that we all need to have, especially women, I think. I mean, everyone needs that, but especially women. If we can do that with kindness, then, I mean, I think we definitely can do that. If there's any human beings that can do that, I think females. It's a general thing to say. I know that some men can do that too. But thank you so much, Donna, for the inspiration. You're welcome and thank you. Thank you. My ending questions to you, I'll ask you this one. What is another word for healing? Peace. If you knew you would die soon, meaning leaving, losing the body, would you make any change or do anything in a different way? I believe I would spend more time with my dear ones. And my last question is, what are three things about life you wish everyone to experience before they lose the body? Deep, connected love, yeah. expansive, high vibrational states of just feeling bliss and joy and knowing without any doubt that they are literally bathing in a sea of love in the wholeness of God mm -hmm. at all times, even if they're not aware of it while they're in a body, to have that trust. Mm -hmm. Yes, a billion times to that. So true. Thank you so much again, Donna, for your presence here today, for our conversation, uh, for the work you do, your beautiful book, your message, and everything else in between that could be felt. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome. And before we say goodbye, where can we find more information about you, your books, products, services, and future projects? Um, everything is listed at uh, witnessawakening.com and my book is on Amazon. Wonderful. I'll have the link on your podcast profile and I'll have the meditation link too. Wonderful. Thank you again and we'll talk soon. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Bye for now, Donna. Bye-bye. Thank you for listening. To learn more about Donna Donahue and her work, please visit witnessawakening.com. To learn more about this podcast, please visit fitforjoy.org slash podcast. Thank you again for listening and bye for now.